In this lecture, we are going to start from scratch again and essentially repeat the last three lectures step by step of how we formulate a finite difference time domain code, how we implement the finite difference time domain code, and then the last thing we'll do in this lecture is a step by step walkthrough modeling transmission and reflection through a dielectric slab. Then we'll be ready to move on. So let's remember what was part of the formulation. This is where we start at Maxwell's equations. We approximate the derivatives with finite differences on a Yi grid. Then we set the x and y derivatives to zero, assuming that we have slabs of infinite extent in the x and y directions and nothing changes. So we can set those derivatives to zero. So we only had the z derivatives left. And in fact, we reduced Maxwell's equations down to our one dimensional problem. And we saw that things decoupled into two independent modes. And we grabbed one of those and proceeded with deriving the update equations. Based on that, we had our basic finite difference time domain engine. We started adding some bells and whistles to this. One, getting a little bit fancier, calculating grid resolution, how to calculate the time step, how to incorporate sources. We talked about boundary conditions for your transforms. And finally, calculating transmittance and reflectance, and then the all important conservation of energy where we add those two and make sure we get 100%. We'll talk, or we did talk a little bit about implementation of how we take those equations into MATLAB. I'll repeat again in this lecture the sequence for code development. We never would look above, see all these bells and whistles, and sit down and write one code that has all of that, and then run it for the first time when we're done. We never would do that. We'll, we'll develop a simple little code that's easily testable, run it, troubleshoot it, then add the next layer, then add the next layer. And we build our finite difference time domain program like an onion in layers. And then this lecture will end with a walkthrough. We'll go step by step of what we would do to model transmission and reflection through a dielectric slab using finite difference time domain. Formulation. First thing we want to do is prepare Maxwell's equations. So we start off with Maxwell's equations in the familiar form. We have square brackets around the permeability and the permittivity indicating that those are potentially tensors. We also recognize at this point that the electric and magnetic fields are about three orders of magnitude different and that can cause numerical problems. So it's always best practice to normalize everything so everything has the same order of magnitude and in fact have that order of magnitude be 1 instead of 10 or 100 or 10 to the 6 or 10 to the minus 3. We like all the numbers to be on the order of 1. Anyway, to make the magnetic field the same order of magnitude as the electric field, we multiply it by the free space impedance. Now using the normalized magnetic field, we can rewrite Maxwell's equations this way. Remember, C0 is the speed of light. The next thing we did was take our curl equations and expand those into a set of six partial differential equations that are now ready to be processed and analyzed. We then introduced a finite difference approximation. We have derivatives in Maxwell's equations, but we only know our field values at discrete points. So how can we estimate our derivatives based on knowing field values at discrete points? So we'll look at this simple one-dimensional case where we know some function at discrete points. So these little tick marks show the discrete points where we know the function values. Well, if we want to calculate a derivative, we look at two adjacent function values, or in our finite difference time domain, these would be two adjacent field values, and the derivative is slope. It's, it's rise divided by run. So the rise is F2 minus F1, and the run is delta x, our, our grid spacing. When we do that, we calculate a derivative that exists at the midpoint. This is a central finite difference. And so we would call this approximation for our first order derivative a second order accurate first order derivative based on finite differences. And this is the only finite difference we'll need to implement finite difference time domain. The first finite difference we actually looked at was the time derivative. And we saw in order for these to be central finite differences and have every term in the equation exist at the same point in time and space, in fact, we had to stagger 
the electric and magnetic fields in time. And we made it so that the electric fields would exist at integer time steps, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the H fields would exist at the half time step, so 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, And so when they're staggered, we can approximate the time derivative with central finite differences, and it satisfies our equations in that every term exists at the same point in time and space. So we staggered the fields in time. Then we started working on the spatial derivatives, and we realized there's really an infinite amount of information. We have to discretize space, and in fact, we really can only store the field value at discrete points. So if we were to store the function that we're showing on the left here at discrete points, our grid and how the data is stored is much more like what's on the right. So we don't know the field values between points. We could do a pretty good job of interpolating but we don't know that. We only know the field values at discrete points. We then introduce something called the Yi grid, where rather than locate all the field components at a common point in the unit cell, which maybe is initially conceptually more simple, we staggered them. And the benefits of this is that by staggering the fields, we're inherently satisfying the divergence equations because remember, we formulate finite difference time domain based on the curl equations and the constitutive relations. In a sense, we've ignored the divergence equations. By staggering the fields, we account for those. Physical boundary conditions are, are satisfied. So if we have material interfaces within, this, within our grid, as long as we stagger the fields in this way, we don't have to do anything special to handle that. Also, Remember when we talked about the curl equations, essentially we saw electric fields are curling around magnetic fields, the magnetic fields curl around electric fields, and the way we've arranged the field components on the Yi grid, the, all of the magnetic fields are encircling the electric fields, and all the electric fields are encircling magnetic fields. So it's very consistent with the physics, and that makes writing our finite difference time domain, or, you know, the finite difference time domain expressions very, very efficient and elegant and simple, in fact. So we stepped one at a time through each of the equations and described how we would approximate our derivatives. And we also said, and maybe I didn't say enough, but our material values, for example, our permeability mu sub xx, we will define to exist at the same points as h sub x. Our mu yy to exist at the same points as hy. Our mu zz to exist at the same points of hz epsilon xx to exist at the same points as ex, epsilon yy to exist at the same points as ey, and epsilon zz to exist at the same points as ez. And that makes our finite difference equations very consistent where every term in that equation exists at the same point in time and space. Anyway, after doing this, we transform our six coupled partial differential equations into a set of six finite difference equations. Then we went on to actually formulating finite difference time domain. The first thing we did was reduce our three-dimensional analysis to one dimension. And it's always important to remember, no matter how many dimensions our model has, we are always doing a three-dimensional simulation, and we need to understand that context. So for a, a one-dimensional simulation, what we've actually said is that we're modeling transmission and reflection through a slab of materials, where each slab, take this purple slab, it's of infinite extent in the y direction and also infinite extent in the x direction. It is of finite thickness and finite dimensions in the z direction, but x and y is infinite. We're also restricting propagation to be completely along the z axis. We're not going to have any waves that travel at, at a slight angle in the x or y directions. This lets us set x and y derivatives to zero. Nothing can change in the x and y directions. Everything's perfectly uniform. Well, when we set the x and y derivative to zero, a lot of terms drop out of Maxwell's equations in the analytical and the finite difference equations. 
and we end up with a greatly reduced set of equations. And we also notice that the equations that are left over, in fact, decouple into two independent modes. One mode contains only e sub x and h sub y, and the other one contains only e sub y and h sub x. We said for isotropic materials, these two will lead to the same solution. If we model the same device, we'll get the same answer. So in fact, we really only need to proceed with one of them. Unless, of course, we're modeling anisotropic materials, in which case they remain independent modes. Once we have our finite difference equations, then we're moving on to the update equations. So the basic process for deriving the update equations, we start with our finite difference equation. We isolate the field value that exists at the future time step. So for example, in this equation, it's e sub y at t plus delta t. And we solve this equation for that term. And working through the algebra, here's where we end up. So we would call that our update equation for e sub y. We have a similar update equation for h sub x. And then we summarize our, our update equations and write them in this form. All the update equations take this basic form. The field value at the future time step equals the field value at the previous time step plus some kind of update coefficient, which is different for each point, times the curl of the other field. So if we're updating the magnetic field, we need the curl of the electric field. If we're updating the electric field, we need the curl of the magnetic field. And we we have a, a bunch of terms that collect together that we call our update coefficients. We don't, these won't change during the simulation, so we don't need to calculate these at every iteration. We'll pre-calculate these and then just use them as update coefficients during our, our simulation. That covered our basic finite difference time domain engine. Then we added a bunch of bells and whistles to this. The first thing we did was talking about grid resolution. How big do we make the cells? And we have two things to consider. We have the minimum wavelength. And so to determine that, we need to know the, the highest frequency that we're interested in because that corresponds to the shortest free space wavelength. Then we have to look through our grid for the highest refractive index. And in fact, that shortest free space wavelength inside the highest refractive index gives us the shortest wavelength that we'll see anywhere in our model. And we want to resolve that with at least 10 points. So that, that big n sub lambda is that number 10. That's at some integer that needs to be 10 or 20 or something like that. The next thing we need to consider is the feature sizes. We look at the minimum feature size in our structure that we want to resolve. And we probably want to resolve that with at least one cell, but maybe even three or four. So now we have two ways of calculating grid resolution. We'll grab the smallest one, because that will also satisfy the other condition. However, we also probably have some dimensions in our device that are absolutely critical to get right. And we haven't considered that yet. And probably, if we do the math, Murphy's Law, uh, we won't get an exact integer number of cells to represent those critical dimensions. So the next step is to make your grid resolution just a little bit smaller until we represent those critical dimensions with an exact number of grid cells. Given the grid size, then we can calculate our time step. And we talked about something called the current stability condition. We showed that in a finite difference time domain model, it's numerically impossible for a wave to propagate farther than one cell in two time steps. So if you're modeling a physical wave that would actually have to propagate faster than that, things would go unstable. That's not possible. So we need to make the time step small enough that the physical wave would not need to outpace the numerical wave. And so that's called the current stability condition. Now in our case, we have an exact calculation for delta t because we are using a perfectly absorbing boundary condition. And we need the case where the wave travels one grid cell in exactly two time steps. And so the way we calculate our delta t ensures that exactly. Then we talked about a Gaussian source. Essentially, we'd like to excite our, our device with an impulse. And then wherever we're interested, we, we record the impulse response. Then, of course, if we Fourier transform the impulse response, 
we get a spectral response over a huge span of wavelengths or frequencies in one single simulation. So how short do we make the pulse? Well, we decide what the bandwidth of that needs to be. What, what range of frequencies do we need in our simulation? So we take the bandwidth and we say 0.5 divided by the bandwidth. That'll be the duration of the pulse. Well, so here's our source as a function of time during the, the course of the simulation. We don't want to start in the middle of this pulse. We want to ease into it and ease out of it. So I like to delay this source by five or six tows before it begins. And that, that ensures we ease into it and ease out of it. And then we can calculate our Gaussian source. That contains enough frequencies and is offset enough that it will be numerically stable. Then we want to estimate how many iterations we need. And I said if we wait at least six tows to ease into the source, we need to wait at least another six tows to ease out of it. So the total duration of simulation, first of all, needs to be at least 12 tows then to go into the pulse and out of it. The next thing we'll do is calculate how long it takes in time for a wave to travel across our grid one time. And I like to wait about five of those. That lets a wave bounce around a little bit or travel at some steep angle to, to leave our grid. Now this works pretty good for devices where a wave just hits them and they scatter. If the device itself is resonant, we probably need to iterate a lot longer. And in fact, rather than just calculate a number of steps, we would just keep running and maybe tracking our conservation or tracking how much power is left in the model. And when all the field values dip below some acceptable value, we would just keep running. But once they dip below that threshold, we end it. So some kind of condition to make sure that all of the power has left our model or at least an acceptable amount of it. Then we talked about this total field scattered field source. And essentially what we're doing is launching a one-way source. We want to define our grid, some point in our grid where we can launch the source toward the device we're modeling. It can do whatever it does with the device and then reflects away. But that scattered wave can pass through, in a transparent way, this total field scattered field region. So above this, we only see the waves that are scattered from our object. We don't see the source up here. Down below, we see both. And in fact, they can be interfering. So in the context of our one-dimensional grid, this is what it might look like, where the first region we would define as scattered field, and the bottom region, the total field. Now here's the problem. We have a finite difference equation sitting in the scattered field at the point immediately next to the total field. It has a finite difference equation which reaches over to the total field side, and now suddenly we have a total field term in a scattered field equation. We need to make that term look like a scattered field, and we need a correction somehow to do that. Likewise, we will have a finite difference equation in the total field which reaches across containing a scattered field term. And we need to correct that to make it look like a total field. When we do those corrections, in fact, that is where we implement our one-way source. So let's see what this looks like. Here's our simulation. That dashed line is our total field scattered field position. And what we can see is a one-way source emerges from that. Notice there's nothing backward propagating. That pulse is only going forward. Right now it's probably an air. It hits a dielectric and starts to deform. Some of that reflects, some transmits. The part that's being transmitted through the dielectric has slowed down and compressed. The reflected pulse passes through that total field scatter field region transparently. No effect there. And then when it hits the boundary, our perfect boundary just lets it appear as if it goes off to infinity. So that's what a total field scatter field source looks like. Uh, and it's really essentially just a one-way source. So we're insured anything on the other side. So in this case, on the left side is only going to be outward propagating. So that's really important for our boundary condition and also how we calculate reflectance and transmittance. So now let's look at the finite difference equations to figure out the numerics behind the total field scatter field. Here, we're in the scattered field, so we're writing a, uh, our update equation for in the scatter field immediately next to the total field. Well, this finite difference equation contains a term from the total field side. That's not compatible with all these scattered field terms. 
So we make a total field look like a scatter field by subtracting the source from it. So that's exactly what's happening here. We subtract a source from it, and now this looks like a scattered field quantity. We can take this source term and move it to the outside of the square brackets, and we arrive here. And something very interesting and very useful happens. We get back our original update equation that we derived before we knew anything about total field scatter field. That means we can, up, we can do our little update procedure just how we've always been doing it across the entire grid. And when we're done that, we just subtract this correction term from the one point that needs it. And that would satisfy the total field scatter field for this update equation. We then have an update equation in the total field side that contains a term from the scattered field. So all of these terms are total field terms, except we're reaching over to the scattered field side for this magnetic field term. So we need to make this scattered field quantity look like a total field quantity. We do that by adding the source to it. So here we're adding the source. So what's inside the parentheses here looks like a total field quantity. Again, we'll pull the source term to the outside. And what we see is that we get our update equation back that we derived before we knew anything about total field scatter field. That lets us update all of the fields across the entire grid. And then after that, just subtract this source term from the one point where we're incorporating the source. So we only require two corrections at two points to implement the total field scatter field source. But we didn't know the source terms. We know we need the E sub Y source term on the total field side, and we need the H sub X source term from the scattered field side. So we have to go to, back to Maxwell's equations to figure out how the amplitudes of these differ, and we need to consider the Y grid because they're, they're offset in time and position, and so we need to compensate for all of that when we calculate the source functions for both of those. And it all came down to this. We have different cases, one for the EXHY mode, the other for the EYHX mode. But first, we just calculate a Gaussian source. And here we, we've set the, the number of iterations, we set the duration of the pulse and its offset, and we just make the electric field that Gaussian. Then we adjust the amplitude and the timing of the magnetic field source term to pair up with this electric field term to give us a valid source. So we see that the amplitude is scaled by the square root of the relative permittivity or the relative permeability. And these are the material properties at the place where the source is being incorporated. We also see that the Gaussian source is offset in, in time and space. So we have the basic Gaussian as a function of time, but there's a delay through half of a grid cell, and there's also half a time step difference between them. And we have a similar thing happening for the other mode. So this is how we calculate the H field source. Usually we just make the electric field source, the pure Gaussian, and then we scale and skew the magnetic field to match the electric field. Then we discuss boundary conditions. We realized we also have finite difference equations at the edge of the grid that require field values from outside of the grid. And that's a problem because we're not storing those. The easy thing we could do is just assume all field values from outside the grid are zero. If we are assuming that there's an electric field that's zero outside the grid, then essentially we've placed a perfect electric conductor outside of the grid and the waves will reflect off of that. Likewise, if we assume there's a magnetic field zero outside the grid, we've essentially placed a perfect magnetic conductor outside of the grid, and again, our waves will perfectly reflect off of that. We introduced a better one that sort of lets waves just hit the boundary and appear as if they go off and just keep going, but there was only certain circumstances we could do this. We had to have the waves at the boundary only traveling outward. If somehow there was bidirectional waves at the boundary points, we couldn't do this boundary condition. The materials at the boundaries have to be linear, homogeneous, isotropic, and non-dispersive. And further, the material values have to be the same at either side of the grid. Then what we realized, we set our time step so that the wave traveled one grid cell in exactly two time steps, 
That means when we need the field value from outside the grid, that will be the same as the field value just inside the grid two time steps ago. So in fact, we just save a record of the fields for two time steps, and we use that as the boundary condition. So we do that at the Z low boundary and the Z high boundary, and then we have our perfect boundaries. And lastly, we talked about doing Fourier transforms. And we said one thing we could do is just record the impulse response at a point, and at the end of our simulation, we have this recording over a function of time, and we just Fourier transform that with an FFT. And that's well and good, except when we go to higher dimension models, the memory starts to explode doing that. So instead, what we can do is calculate the Fourier transforms as it is simulating. So we went from the analytical expression for a Fourier transform and implemented that numerically. And the way we did that was for every frequency that we're interested in, we calculate this exponential function because it's unique for each frequency. And we call that the kernel. So if we're interested in doing a frequency sweep over 100 frequency points, we'll have 100 of these kernels. So for every time step, that's m here, our time steps will go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We take this kernel that we've pre-calculated and raise it to the power of the time step and multiply it by the field value at whatever point we're interested in Fourier transforming. We multiply the two and we just keep adding that up to a tally that started off as zero. We just keep adding as we go. And when the time loop is done, we finish it off by multiplying by delta t. And then we have a Fourier transform at that frequency we're interested in. And we do this, we have one of these integrations happening for every frequency and every point that we're interested in. The last thing, if we Fourier transformed our reflected fields and transmitted fields, what we see is that they decay. And this does not mean we have lower transmission and lower reflection. If we look at the Fourier transform of our source, we see that the source also rolls off at high frequencies. So our reflection and transmission are only rolling off here simply because we have less power in the source at those higher frequencies. So we need to remove that, that artifact. And we do that by dividing by that reflection Fourier transform by the source Fourier transform and the same thing on the transmission side. So that essentially, I'll say, flattens out our reflectance and transmittance curves. And if we're ignoring loss in our model, we should be able to add what gets reflected and what gets transmitted and get 100%. So this is conservation, and doing it in this case, we get 100% all the way across. So assuming there's no loss or no gain, our conservation should be perfect and flat. And there's reasons that it won't be. Maybe we incorporated loss or gain. Maybe we made a mistake. Maybe there's power still stuck in a device and it's resonating and we need to iterate for more iterations. So there are reasons that we can violate that, but a good, solid, robust simulation has a flat conservation. Even if I am modeling something with loss or with gain, I will initially turn off that loss or gain so that the materials are lossless and perfect in some sense, simulate it, make sure I get conservation, and then turn the loss or gain on. If we incorporate loss, that conservation curve should dip down below one. If we incorporate gain, it should go above one. Now let's talk about the implementation. A very important thing is the grid strategy. And one thing we'll do is build the device in the middle of the grid, but then put spacer regions around it. We mentioned because we have a very good boundary condition, it's perfect, we actually don't need these spacer regions. We will need that when we go to two and three dimensions, so we'll start doing it now to get into the habit. But it's also good to include these spacer regions just for visualization. If our boundaries are right up against our device, we really can't visualize what's being reflected or transmitted. So I really like including these anyway. At some point way to the far left of the grid, we'll have our total field scattered field interface. And to the right contains the source and scattered fields. To the left are only the reflected fields. So we leave, we leave at least one cell here. We only need one. And that is where we'll record our reflected fields. Since this is in the scattered field region, we won't be seeing the source here. So any fields here have to be reflected from our device. 
Likewise, on the other side, this is where we we'll record our transmitted fields. Now, I'm only showing a dozen cells or so. Real grids have many hundreds of cells. So that's our, our basic grid strategy. So let's pull all of this together into a block diagram. First step is initialize MATLAB. So we clear figure windows, clear memory, clear the command window, anything like that you might want to do. Maybe define constants, meters equals one. Uh, so you have length, you have uh, frequency, stuff like that. Then we go on to defining the simulation parameters. What frequencies are you interested in for your transforming? How big is your device? What materials is it made of? Your grid resolution parameters. Do you want to uh, represent every wavelength with 10 cells, 20 cells, etc.? Then we actually start doing work. We calculate the grid resolution. We consider the minimum wavelength and minimum feature size. We'll resolve the minimum wavelength with at least 10 cells and minimum features with at least one cell. We may also want to snap the grid to critical dimensions where we make that grid resolution just a little bit smaller until we represent some critical dimension with an exact integer number of grid cells. Then we calculate our time step. We look at the refractive index right at our boundaries and calculate so that the wave will move exactly one cell in two time steps. Then we'll calculate our source. We're using a Gaussian source. So we calculate its duration based on the bandwidth we want it to have. We offset it by about six tau's or six durations of the pulses. We'll set the electric field equal to the pulse itself, and then we will choose to scale the magnetic field to match the electric field because the two need to be a rigorous solution to Maxwell's equations. And the amplitude is different due to the impedance of the material, and the timing is different because they're a half cell apart and also a half time step apart. Then we'll initialize our Fourier transforms. We calculate all the kernels, one kernel for every frequency we're interested. We initialize our Fourier transforms to zero, and we have one of those for every frequency and every point. Whereas the kernels, we have only one for every frequency, no matter how many points. Then we calculate all the update coefficients. Then we set all the fields across our entire grid to zero. We'll also initialize those boundary terms to all zeros. Now we're ready to enter the main loop, the main time loop. So we enter our time loop, and the first thing we'll do is update the H field from the curl of the E field, also in incorporating our perfectly absorbing boundary term, E sub 3. Then we handle the source. Once we're done updating and looping over Z, we at the one point, which is in the scattered field, we'll, we'll update the source or include that source correction. Then we record the H field at the boundary. Then we update the electric field, incorporating that perfectly absorbing boundary using that term H sub 3. Once we're done updating that across the entire grid, then at the one point in the total field, we subtract that correction term to handle the E field component of the source. Then we record the E field at the boundary. At this point, we'll update all of the Fourier transforms. I'm showing a delta T explicit here, although we may choose to do that outside of the main loop. At that point, all of the work of finite difference time domain is done. But we may want to visualize this while it's running. I like to superimpose the fields on top of the materials. I like to show reflectance and transmittance and especially the conservation. And we may want to speed this up. If we draw this every iteration, that will run very, very slow because the graphics is very slow. So maybe we'll choose to only update the graphics every 10 iterations, every 10 seconds, or something like that. Then when we're done, we have our Fourier transforms. We need to divide those Fourier transforms by the source Fourier transform. That sort of flattens them out and normalizes it. We add them together for the the conservation and we look at that. And again, we may want to visualize our fields. Maybe we Fourier transformed all the fields across the entire grid and we want to visualize that. And then maybe we want to plot reflection and transmission on a linear scale, dB scale, and maybe there's something else we want to do. This is called post-processing. The simulation's done, we're just number crunching the results. But that's it, then we're finished. And this is a, a reasonably sophisticated one-dimensional finite difference time domain. And if we can understand this, when we go to two dimensions, everything should be pretty straightforward.
And a lot of times I'm asked for a block diagram on one sheet of paper. So here's the entire block diagram. And if you access the electronic notes, you can turn your paper 90 degrees and you have everything all in one block diagram for a one dimensional finite different time domain. And what you'll see is the block diagram really doesn't change for two or even three dimensional finite different time domain. The, the basic main steps remain the same. We just have more points to do update coefficients in. I definitely want to step through once again the sequence for code development. I, I can't overemphasize this. We'll never just sit down, write a complete code with lots of bells and whistles, and when we're done writing that, hit run for the first time. That's the worst thing we can do. We want to build this in a sequence, like layers on an onion. We build the inner core engine, we run that, we make sure that works. We add one little bell or whistle to it, run that, make sure it's work, and we keep doing this step by step. So the first step in here, let me run this. This is the basic finite difference time domain engine. We're, we're updating E from H, H from E. We're going back and forth, E, H, E, H, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Nothing's happening here. That's a good thing. We don't want anything to happen because we have not put a source in here. If suddenly we saw numbers somewhere, that's a sign that something's wrong with your code. So we'll definitely absolutely do this. Have, when you implement your code, start writing it. Just get the basic EH engine working and run it and make sure nothing happens. Step two. Here, we'll just add a very simple soft source just by adding to some point in the middle of the grid. What we're looking for now is that these pulses propagate without changing amplitudes. They should not grow. They should not decay. There shouldn't be any other numbers exploding. They definitely should move. Also, when they hit the boundaries, at this point, we should see them reflect. And we can let this run for a very long time. Those pulses should just keep bouncing back and forth. So this lets us know everything's working. We, we will notice there's a little bit of ringing that starts to happen on the trailing edge of these pulses. That's dispersion due to the grid. We'll talk more about that later in the semester, but that is perfectly normal and there's ways that we can handle that to improve it. That's not physical. That doesn't really happen. That's just something that happens in our model. Okay, so we added a very simple soft source, not a real usable one, just something that throws energy at our boundaries that we can start testing things. Same source, but now we do our, our perfect boundary condition. So remember, the whole purpose of that simple source is just to throw energy at our boundaries and see what happens. So with our perfect boundary, they should appear as if they just go off to infinity and nothing should start exploding. Uh, if we kept iterating, it should stay at zero. So that was step three. Step four, now that our boundaries are working, we can modify our source to be a little bit more sophisticated, and we try our one-way source. Notice it should not propagate backwards at this point. We can control the amplitude much better, and our boundary should still work. And if we kept iterating, nothing should explode at this point. Next step, we want to move our total field scatter field source over to the left-hand side. And we also want to start calculating transmission and reflection. So we record reflection at the far left side of the grid, and we record transmission at the far right-hand side of the grid. Now here, since there's no devices, we should see 100% transmission. And as soon as the pulse crosses that, we can Fourier transform it. That's exactly what we see. Now, I did also plot here a conservation line. It just so happens in this case that it's hidden behind the transmission line, which is what we expect. Another thing I'll point out that you'll see, and I'm not sure if you can make it out on these slides, but you'll see what, what look like apparent ripples here. And in fact, what you're looking at is a phenomenon happening on the order of 10 to the minus 10. But in terms of which pixel MATLAB draws in, that you're right on the edge of that. So you're not looking at anything that's actually a significant ripple. It's just more of a numerical artifact in, in MATLAB. So if you see that, don't necessarily worry about it. You may want to zoom in on it with the zoom tool in MATLAB and just make sure those really aren't sizable ripples. But in this case, if we were to zoom in on it, we could just keep zooming in on it and it wouldn't change in magnitude. The last and final step, our algorithm is ready and we 
we simply put a device in and everything should work. So let me play this. So in comes our pulse, bounces off the device. We get a little bit of reflection recorded. Our conservation line is hiding behind the reflection curve because we haven't recorded any transmission yet. As soon as we have that, now we see our conservation curve is still pretty far off. And why is that? Because there's energy stuck in our model. Notice there's that pulse bouncing back and forth still inside the model. Conservation looks horrible here. Again, there's, there's energy stuck in our model. But if we let this run and just keep letting it run and run and run, that conservation line will eventually be flat, meaning the, the energy that's stuck in our model is inconsequential. You'll never get it exactly to zero. You just you keep running the simulation until it is sufficiently small. This simulation took 10,000 iterations. But at the end of 10,000, the conservation does look pretty flat. So that looks pretty good. If we let it run, it would look even better. So because you can't play movies on paper, uh, I just included a summary of what we saw. Step one was the basic FTTD algorithm where nothing happened and shouldn't happen. And if it does, then that's a sign something's wrong. We added a very simple soft source where we just added the source to the value in the middle. And we're not really controlling the source that well yet, but it throws energy at the boundaries. So on step three, we can incorporate our perfect boundary and we can watch that work and test it. Then we did a one-way source, our total field scatter field technique. At that point, we moved our one-way source over to the left, calculated transmittance and reflectance, and then we added our device, and we have a fully functional fi one-dimensional finite difference time domain model. Now the last part of this lecture is a walkthrough. We, we just stepped through all the formulation and implementation. Now let's actually step through a model on how we would do things. Divide this into four main steps. The first one is define the problem. So we have to answer what device are we modeling? What does it look like? What materials is it made of? What do we want to learn about the device? So in fact, step one doesn't involve any MATLAB. This is what we need to have sitting in front of us before we can even begin to program things. Then step two, we initialize. This is our grid resolution based on our device, assigning material values to points on the grid based on our device, computing time step, initializing our Fourier transforms. Then finally, the step three is running the finite difference time domain. This is the main loop. And then when we're done and we have our results, we analyze or post-process the data. So step one, define the problem. This doesn't involve any MATLAB, but what device are we modeling? Well, in this case, it's a slab of some kind of material that has a relative permeability of two and a relative permittivity of six. Surrounded by air, it's one foot thick. So that's its geometry and what materials it's made of. Then what do we want to learn? Well, let's calculate the transmittance and reflectance from that slab from zero to one gigahertz. So this is everything on paper. Now we have to put this in MATLAB. So the first thing in MATLAB is calculating the grid. Well, for accurate results, let's say we want to resolve the minimum wavelength with 20 cells. So what we'll do is we'll calculate the maximum refractive index. So the maximum permeability and permittivity are two and six. So the maximum refractive index will be 3.46. Then we want to know the minimum wavelength. Well, the maximum frequency will be one gigahertz. So C over F max times N max gives us a minimum wavelength of 8.6 centimeters. So that'll be the wavelength corresponding to the maximum frequency in the region of the highest refractive index. And we want to divide that by about 20 cells. So our grid resolution based on wavelength is about 0.43 centimeters or 4.3 millimeters. Well, let's think about resolving the minimum dimensions. We want to resolve this slab probably with at least four points. So we'll set that uh, resolution parameter to four. Our critical dimensions, 30 centimeters divided by four. That means our grid resolution should be at least 7.6 centimeters. Well, we go with the smallest one. So in this case, we're wavelength limited. That makes sense because it's a pretty thick slab.
So our first guess at grid resolution, our delta Z parameter, is 0.4327 centimeters. Okay, so how many grid cells do we need? We want to snap the grid to our critical dimension, and in this case, our critical dimension is the slab. So critical dimension is 30.48 centimeters. That's the thickness of the slab. We just calculated our grid resolution, and we come out to 70.44 cells. So in other words, it's about 70 and a half cells that we need to represent that thickness exactly. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to represent this with the exact integer number of grid cells for the best accuracy. So we'll take that number we just calculated, 70.44, and round up and say we actually want to resolve that with exactly 71 cells. So what we'll do is recalculate our delta Z, and it's the critical, param critical dimension divided by this number of cells, which was just 71. So we will adjust our delta Z parameter now to 0.4293. Notice it got a little bit smaller but that let us represent the slab with an exact integer number of cells. Size of the grid. Well, let's have spacer regions on either side be about 10 cells. We already know that our slab will be 71 cells, and we need maybe another extra cell for to record the transmitted field, and another couple here for the source. And you know, maybe you don't need those, maybe you just include those in your spacer regions, either way, but I'm, I'm choosing to add those discreetly here. So the total size of our grid, 71 cells for the device. We have two spacer regions, another 20 cells, plus another three cells for where we do our source and record planes. So we have a total, or need a total, of 94 cells in this context. So our grid will be 94 cells. Now we want to build our device on this grid. So like we talked about in the MATLAB lectures, filling in stuff like this, I like to calculate a start and a stop index. So let's calculate the start index. We know we want to skip the first two cells. That's our reflection point and our total field scatter field point. Our spacer region's 10 cells, and we'll come over an extra one just for good luck, and we want to start at the 13th cell. So NZ1 will be 13. Then how do we calculate NZ2? It's NZ1 plus how many cells wide that is, and we just calculated this will be 71, and then we subtract one so we're not off by one cell. Again, we talked about that subtracting one in the MATLAB lectures. So the stop index will be 83. So we need to fill in from 13 up to 83. And we do it for two arrays. We have a UR and an ER array. We'll first initialize those all to probably ones, and then from NZ1 up to NZ2, we fill in ER and UR. Now our material arrays are done. We're ready to move on. We need to calculate our time step. So we have an exact equation here because of our boundaries. It's the refractive index at the boundaries, or in this case it's air, times our delta Z parameter. Remember that's our adjusted parameter over two times the speed of light. So our time step is about 7.1599 picoseconds. We know we want to model up to a frequency of 1 gigahertz, so our duration of that pulse needs to be about 5 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds, or about 500 picoseconds total. Our offset, I'm offsetting about 6 tau, so that's about 3 nanoseconds. Then we want to estimate how many time steps we need. That slab is probably not strongly resonant, so we can get away just with uh, five propagations across the grid. So we calculate the time it takes to go once across the grid inside the maximum refractive index, and that's about 4.6 nanoseconds. So the total simulation time should be almost three times 10 to the minus eight seconds. If we take that total time and divide by our time step, we have about 4,095 iterations. So a little over 4,000 iterations should give us a reasonable simulation. Then our source. Remember the electric and magnetic fields are delayed because they are a half cell apart and a half time step apart. 
And where we're injecting the source, refractive index is one. So it turns out this is three delta T over two for this case. And so the delay between the electric and magnetic fields is about 10 picoseconds. We calculate the amplitude. We're injecting in free space, so the amplitude is the same as the electric field, just inverted. So it's 180 degrees out of phase. The electric field we just calculate as the Gaussian, the delayed Gaussian. Then the magnetic field has a different amplitude, and it also has a different skew, which we calculate up here is about 10 picoseconds. So here's the code for calculating all of the source terms. Then we also initialize our Fourier transforms. Here we want 100 frequency points going from 0 to 1 gigahertz with 100 frequency points. So this is our frequency axis, if you will. Then we calculate our array of kernels, one for each frequency that we're interested in. Then we calculate our reflection Fourier transform, or I'm sorry, initialize the reflection Fourier transform, the transmission Fourier transform, and the source Fourier transform. So initialization and setting up the problems done, now we enter the main finite difference time domain loop. So we iterate over time. We update H from E, so we're looping over the Z coordinates, and we do this without considering total field scatter field. After we're done doing this, then we go ahead and we subtract this correction term from that point in the scatter field right on the edge of the interface between the two. Then we update E from H, so we loop over the grid. Again, we do this without considering total field scatter field. When this is done, we then incorporate this correction at a single point in the grid. Then we update our Fourier transforms at any point and frequency we're interested in. So this is a loop over frequency now. And then we may choose to visualize our fields. And this keeps going until we've done 4,095 iterations. So if we're looking at our, our field, this, this is what's happening. Um, here's the here's at the beginning of the simulation, at some intermediate point, and we're going later, 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 and finally at the end, here's our fields, and here's transmission reflection spectra, and you can see the conservation line. So I know they're small pictures, but it's just to give you an idea of what you're you'll be looking at. Once we have these Fourier transforms, always remember to divide by the source Fourier transforms because otherwise these will tend to look like there's less reflection and transmission at the higher frequencies, and that's not the case. That's just because there's less power in the source at the higher frequencies. So we divide to normalize, and that sort of flattens these two things out. And then if we add them together, we get our conservation curve. And in the end, we should see something like this coming out of MATLAB, where we see our reflection, our transmission, and then our conservation of energy flatlined at around 100%. So here's MATLAB code for how the normalizations and calculating the conservation, what that looks like.